Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. This is our January members meeting for Portland Urban Beekeepers. And we've got a special um, night tonight, two presentations, one about Nosema with Brian Fackler and one about um, a pollen and nectar report from Glenn, Glenn Andreessen. Um, we want to start by thanking the previous board. Because of all their hard work, we had a great 2022. Um, and we have some new members uh, on our board this year. Uh, one new member is me, Brent Hyrak. I'm the new president. We also have a new vice president, Richard Koss. Our treasurer is Brian. He's returning from last year. Our communicator is Jess Anderson, the librarian, Katie Fackler, education, Susie Wilcox, member at large, Carl Strobel, and our new apiary manager, Jana Patterson. Uh, we love it that you support Pub, and we want you to continue to do so. Uh, reform list. Last year, we got um, over 250 calls, and th that means that you can go and get a swarm if your name comes up. We have a great Bee Buddy program, which we're going to talk about a little bit. We have Bee Days at the Apiary. A, uh, a nice library with books, candle molds, DVDs, etc. We have also an equipment rental section. Uh, we have extractors, refractometers, an observation hive, and a frame jig for rent. We also have on the website a really effective classifieds section. Uh, most importantly, your help funds our mission here at Portland Urban Beekeepers with our bee research and our, our activities. Last year, we had $3,500 donated. Again, the annual membership is $25. Tell your friends. Let's talk about the Bee Buddy program. As you can see, there's a map. And on that map is the uh, geographical location of mentors and learners. Once you sign up for the Bee Buddy program, your address will become visible. And you can zoom into your address and find out uh, what kind of other beekeepers are near you. Signing up is really easy. You go to the pub website, you click on resources and then Bee Buddy Map, and then this form, and you'll get this, um, this dialogue called the Pub Bee Buddy Program. Easy to fill out, just a little bit of information about you. You can choose if you wanna be a mentor or a learner. And like magic, your uh, location will be put on our, our Bee Buddy map. Uh, Pub has a great relationship with OSU, and we are offering two scholarships this year, one for the Master Beekeeping Program and one for the Oregon Master Melatology Program. Now, keep in mind, if you're awarded the grant, you must complete three speaking engagements or assist in public service on behalf of Pub. Let's talk, uh, talk about the application process. It needs to be finished by the 18th of this month. Mail your application letter to the president at Portland Urban Beekeepers. We'll review it in January and announce the winner in February. Please include these on your application. What got you interested in bees and beekeeping? Why do you want to join the OMB or the Melatology program? How will your study of bee biology or beekeeping contribute to your short and long-term plans to support bees? This one's important. Does your current workload and schedule allow you to support pubs education efforts as outlined above? And finally, why are you a good candidate to receive the pub scholarship? Remember that has to, all that uh, has to be in by the 18th of this month. Um, we have a wonderful B school. Excuse me. I yeah, have a yeah. question. Um, where is that? Where is the course taught or the program? Um, <clears throat> is it in Portland or? As I understand it, you receive um, materials and some instruction online, and a lot of it is kind of complete by yourself. You're also at some point. You're also assigned a mentor, and that mentor uh, plans activities, but. Actually, Janet, you might be able to answer that question a little better. 
Yeah, I'll just, I'll give you a little bit of information on it. And then if anybody wants more information, um, I can connect with you over chat and give you my uh, contact information and we can connect on it later in more detail. But um, the Master Beekeeper program at OSU has three levels, um, apprentice, journey, and master. Um, and at the apprentice level, you are assigned a local mentor to work with. And there is online coursework to do all the, um, it's all over um, a platform called Canvas that most colleges use. And um, it's all recorded lectures and quizzes um, that are done online um, at the apprentice level. There's um, a written test at the end. Um, it's open book and untimed though. So it's not too hard to pass that test. Um, and then you have to pass certain um, aspects with your mentor um, before you can move on to the journey level. Um, so the journey level, I mean, the um, apprentice level and the journey level both are basically self-paced online um, coursework. Does that Wait. answer the question? Yeah, yeah. And it, and is, so is the scholarship for all three levels or just the first level? It's just for the first level. For the first year, you are welcome to apply in other years as well. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, in the first year, it's, I'm pretty sure the fee is still $300. Um, at least it was when I did the apprentice level last year. I'd have to look and see what it is this year, but I think it's probably still 300 Great, thank you. Sure. Okay. Our B school is designed for the beginning beekeeper. Um, Susie um, makes a very kind of detailed uh, and actionable um, course. So you're going to get to learn the finer points about beekeeping and what to do and when to do it. It consists of four two hour lessons for a total of eight hours via Zoom, live or recorded. And there's a two hour apiary se session with Susie and Jana out at Green Acres. The cost of the course is $110 for the four classes in the apiary session. And it includes the third and most recent edition of Honey Bee Biology and Beekeeping by Dewey Karen. It's a must read for um, all beginning beekeepers. Of course, when you're doing the bee school, you can supercharge your experience by participating in the bee, uh, the bee buddy map. And Brent, I sure. posted the uh, link to bee school 2023 in the chat if anyone's interested. Oh, okay. Thank you, Richard. Uh, the dates are Thursdays once a month uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. The class will cover introduction to beekeeping and the equipment how to obtain and install your bees. Uh, uh, honeybee biology and behavior, how to do inspections. We talk about varroa mite biology and an integrated pest management strategy. Seasonal management that is um, specific for the Pacific Northwest, Northwest. And of course, the honey harvest. Uh oh, something's not working. Huh. Okay. Are we at B days? Yeah. Um, B days are really special. Uh, they're gonna uh, they're gonna start in March or April, weather dependent. And Jana has modeled the apiary as a teaching apiary, which means we work together in a hands-on kind of way to learn about many facets of beekeeping. All experiences are welcome. Beginners bring their questions and curiosity and uh, more advanced beekeepers bring a wealth of knowledge and oftentimes a willingness to uh, participate and converse with new beekeepers. Now we're looking uh, for ways to grow and expand the range of topics this year. And Jana has something really special in store, something new to Portland Urban Beekeepers. And um, of course, we're always open for topic suggestions and 
people getting involved if they so desire. Jana, did you want to talk about um, an event that just uh, unfolded for the apiary next yes. month? Yes, thank you. Um, today, um, I, Tim and I have not um, nailed down the exact date yet, but it will be either February 4th or February 5th. Um, we will be having a um, learn how to build a hive box and frames workshop. Um, we will have a limited number of um, kits available for you to purchase either a box um, along with 10 frames or just a box. And so watch your emails really closely for that information to come out um, for signing up for that. Um, so we're going to, we'll have that set up and then um, the bone, we'll have like the nails, we'll have the screws, we'll have the wood glue, we'll have the hammers, the screwdrivers, we'll have everything that you need there. So um, if you purchase a kit from us, you'll just show up and build your stuff and go home with it. Um, and then Tim, I think some of you probably know Tim Wessels. Um, he's one of the pub founding members. He's been a beekeeper for decades and um, he is downsizing a little bit, streamlining some things. And so he's going to be um, that weekend, whichever day we do it, he's also going to be selling a ton of used equipment. And I was out there today helping him go through it. There's deep boxes, 10 frame and eight frame. He's got frames, he's got bottom boards, he's got Vivaldi's, he's got telescoping covers. Um, I, I can't remember what all he has out there, but he's got quite a lot of stuff. So if you um, don't make it timing wise to get a kit for the new stuff, or if you just want to get some really inexpensive, cheap old stuff that's already used, but already put together and still in decent shape, um, that will be another really great option for um, resources for getting your apiary built, excuse me, getting your apiary built up this spring. So if anyone right. has any questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat or uh, contact me directly um, at the apiary um, email for Portland Urban Beekeepers. Janet, how are, how are members notified about the dates and times of a, uh, B, uh, B days at the apiary? Oh, B days, they're on the event calendar already on the um, um, website. Okay. And early in the spring, I'm I'm going to hold it from eleven to one on the first and third Sundays of the month, and in the summer, so that it's a little bit warmer in the day when it's we have the cooler weather, and then in the summer when it's hot, I'm going to bump it back to ten to noon, so we have a little bit cooler in the morning, um, so we're not out there in the extreme heat. So um, the time is going to vary a little bit depending on the season. Um, I don't know yet whether we're going to start in mid to late March or if we're going to start in April because I don't know what the weather is going to be like. So just keep an eye on that event um, calendar on the website. And I will also make sure I send out club wide emails um, announcing um, what we're going, you know, when we're going to start, kind of what the plan for the day is, but understanding that. I might have a great plan, but the bees might not agree with the plan. And so right. <laughs> we kind of have to roll with what the bees are doing that day. But um, we're, we're going to, I think we're going to have a really exciting program this year. We're going to, it's going to be a little bit different structure. Um, we're going to have the same basic teaching model where we're going to have a lot of coaching. We're going to have a lot of hands on. We're going to have a lot of questions. Um, like you said earlier, we're going to be trying to expand. Um, the topics and um, the skills that we're doing out there, hoping we're going to be doing some splits and selling some splits. I hoping that we're going to be doing some queen rearing. I hoping that we're going to be doing a lot of different um, things out there this year. So stay tuned for um, emails about the apiary. Excellent. Thank you, Jenna. Um, we're hosting all kinds of exciting and interesting speakers. Of course, tonight we have Brian and Glenn. Uh, in February, we'll talk about small hive beetles with Susan Crook. Uh, March, Frank Rikovich. Uh, we'll talk about Varroa anatraz resistance. 
and how to monitor that. In April, uh, Dr. Ramesh Sagili will talk about Varroa and nutrition management. We're always open for speaker suggestions and topics from members. Again, mail uh, the president at Portland Urban Beekeepers to um, tell us what you want us to talk about. Okay, without further ado, let's get a pollen and nectar report from Glenn. Oh, that's me. Okay. So we're doing all right so far here? Looks good, yeah. All right. Okay. Get that out of the way. Did you draw that? No, but it's my friend did. Absolutely. It's just gorgeous. Yeah, that's what that's what I thought. I actually bought this from my friend who uh, did this original drawing, and so I'm glad to use it here. Oops, that's not what we want. Nice. All right. January, February, and March. Oh, I uh, just to continue on what I've uh, done in the past here, and that is to to show you here what from my power bill from Pacific Power. I'm in that small little uh, portion of Portland that has Pacific Power, and so they tell me what the average temperature was for the for the month, and you can see that's pretty cold, uh, quite a bit colder than it has been for what six, seven years. And uh, you guys were talking earlier today, uh, I mean, before the before we went live, that your, your bees were flying? Yes, <laughs> yeah, your bees, a few your of bees, them. Your bees aren't in East, <laughs> I mean, in Northeast Portland, are they? Mine are, I'm in Pacific Power area too. Yeah, boy, yeah. it was, I don't think it got to 41 degrees and the wind was blowing at 20 miles an hour. So no, I didn't see any bees today. Not not today. We were talking <laughs> about earlier in the week. Sorry, Glenn. Yeah, <laughs> it was earlier oh, in the week. It, oh, might okay. be last, it, was, it was last weekend. All right. All right. No activity today from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Then we're in the same, uh, uh, same page here. Uh, no, let's see here. Huh. Yeah, we use mouse guards uh, to present, prevent this. Uh, and then this is terrible when you see this on your bottom board. Those little tiny uh, now dead mice, but I don't like to see it. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is one of three plants now, I probably review this every year, that can and do bloom every month of the year. Uh, I've put borage in that group now because uh, I've seen them in, uh, blooming in every month of the year. I don't think they're blooming this month though. Uh, that freeze and ice, we just wiped out a lot of things. So things are gonna be later, I would guess this year here. <clears throat> the hellebores will come out uh, probably in February of this year, not January, like it was, what, three years ago now. More hellebores. And these uh, buttercup, I almost hate to uh, admit that this is a at least a decent bee plant because it's so invasive. Right. But I guess we'll take what we can get. It's not our responsibility to grub out invasive plants for everybody. But I sure would, uh, if it was in growing in your yard, I'd, I'd get rid of it as soon as you can, or if you can. No bulbs. Oh yes, what am I saying here? The crocus here, these, uh, the, uh, the Thomasinas here, the Tommies here, I, they'll start popping up in, in lawns. I, I see them more and more. Uh, and then this wonderful 
collection of them at Wilshire Park in the southwest corner. And it's just great. And if we get a sunny day, it'll just be buzzing. One of my favorites. Winter jasmine is, uh, if you have it, it's, it's, it's going to be late in blooming and it may have been wiped out by the, that cold icy weather. I think the honeysuckle will be all right though. There are some food plants. Uh, this is the second of the plants that can bloom every month of the year, members of the, the brassica family here. Uh, this is broccoli here, but if you let cauliflower or cabbage or, or uh, some greens go, they'll bloom and bees will certainly find them. Asian pears, not until March or April, uh, these fruit trees. But Asian pears and cherries are the earliest blooming. Quite a few shrubs. Here, this Edgeworthia, the oriental paper bush, has a nice scent too. And certainly not in January, but uh, I, I would expect not even until March this year. This is a very common foundation plant, we might call it for, for our homeowners and kind of showy. Uh, I think they're a little too common, but the bees will, will certainly find them in bumblebees and, and other small insects that are able to come out early in the, in the season. Flowering current, which this reminds me that I got an email this morning or sometime today from the East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. And they are having their, their annual native plant sale starting up again this year. It wasn't, I'm not sure if it was just last year that they didn't do it or two years now, but you can get some very inexpensive small plants, you know, you know four inch pots or something like that, but for three to five bucks. And this ribes here, which is a, a native, they are, you could get that there. It's, it's one of the natives that are very attractive to honeybees and a relatively early bloomer. So that's the, their, their website. You can find it at the East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. It's just the five letters, East Multnomah, E-M-S-W-D. Dot, probably, I don't know what it is. You'll find it. Glenn, when, when would you plant the, the rivies? Oh, probably uh, if the weather was more decent now, you could do it now because these generally aren't bare root plants. They are coming apart. But the, 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 you probably wouldn't be able to get this until, I don't, I don't remember when their plant sale is. You, you order online and then we'll go to their place, which is on in North Portland off between North and Northeast Portland on uh, Vancouver near Alberta. We have lots of uh, heaths or heathers here and I have a, fa a fair number of, of uh, different shots of these here. Uh, and, and this is a good one from the OSU side, I believe this is where I got this about the different uh, types of heaths or heather. And the one on the, you can see my cursor here, this one here on the right here, the common heather or ling, that, that notice that this has petals. The others all have bells, more like blueberries. And these are easier to get. And as uh, consequently, uh, these are easier for the bees to get to the pollen and nectar. And so that would be a better bet. But as you'll see in these photos that have been submitted, by some pub members here, they're all the bell type. Lauren Smith, no longer with pub and Linda Zoll is, very, is still active, but she's active in the uh, B group that she started in Columbia County. So I'm very happy to see 
her uh, continuing on. Susie's still around, obviously. Uh, I don't hear much from Dan Brown either, but uh, you know, once I once again, these are the the bells, the bell types. Certainly attract, excuse me, honeybees, but uh, the other that lean type would be better. And then my favorite plant for the uh, for this time of year is is these. Uh, this is Arthur Menzies, which is the uh, it's a great, it's, it, they're native to China, I believe, and they're a cross. So they're kind of a cousin to the Oregon grape. They're still Mahonia, but there's this, this, this one, the Arthur Menzies. And this is the next door to my house here that I, I planted this plant here and it's much larger now. And unfortunately it was blooming nicely, but boy, it's, it took a hit. Uh, there are still some blooms that are starting to come out, but anything that was blooming, is, is dead. Not the plant, just the blooms. And I, I planted another Mahonia cross in the backyard, uh, this one called Charity. And uh, you can see on this one here, the, how pointy these leaves are. And they, may, they would make a great security plant if, if, you know, if you desire that or needed it. Very pokey, I mean, just, you're going to hurt when you when you prune this thing. So wear uh, thick leather gloves. But uh, these these plants can just hum if we get the right weather, which we haven't had this this season yet uh, for them. And then this is another type of of Mahonia that's called soft caress for good reason. And then that these leaves here are very soft; they're not pointy at all. And yet it's a Mahonia and the bees will visit it, but much smaller plant too. You might plant this in, you know, if, if you're in, to cover up your foundation or something like that. Uh, wonderful plant. And <clears throat> you can see that these will bloom uh, even, even into, uh, I'll go back a slide here, into February. And then maybe in March starts our native Mahonia. Do I have a yeah. photo of that? I should if I don't. There it is. Yeah, March and April. So these plants can bloom from, oh, say October to April. Once again, this is a, a native plant here and would be available at the uh, East Multnomah a native plant sale. And viburnums are blooming now, although once again, they took a hit. Another native, the Indian plum, uh, does produce plums, but no great, uh, nothing great. A lot of pollen there on that bee though. There are some trees, including if you're from Oregon, they're filberts, if you're not, then they're hazelnuts. Uh, one of the earliest sources of pollen. Great photo here from Stephen. The catkins, the male part. Azara microphylla. I'm gonna have. I have. There's some in my neighborhood that have been planted, and I'm going to uh, endeavor to get a photo with bees on them because I understand they can just hum. Red alder. Beautiful photos here by Tim. Only pollen in this plant from the, the catkins, the, the male catkins. Another plant, native plant that you could get from uh, the East Multnomah is the native big leaf maple, the largest big leaf maple in the world. And, but you need space for it because it's a huge plant, but beautiful. <clears throat> and then I, I think probably most maples are, are a good source, uh, early source, including the Norway maples, which are uh, considered a nuisance tree by the city of Portland. And you're no longer permitted to plant this on city property anyway. Comes my cat again. There is this one cover crop that I have not uh, planted yet, 
but it's a member of the brassica family this Cam camelina sativa uh false flax and it's a very fast growing and you could even plant it uh in february but i haven't tried it yet some weeds, and this is our third plant that can bloom every month of the year and does. When I was raking up leaves before the cold hit, I saw some blooming dandelions, no bees on them, but it's a very bright orange pollen that the, the bees will collect from it. I mean, you'll see that coming into the hive. And there's porridge again. So I've already posted at least the January blooms at the Bridgetown Bees website. And that's my story. Thank you. Glenn, we do have a question in the chat. Um, does anyone know the latest blooming linden tree? I think it's the, uh, there's a cultivar called uh, silver, uh, no, not silver, sterling. And that blooms later than the little leaf or the big leaf uh, linden. And I think you can get that sterling from friends of trees and i recommend it because it's it's it blooms into feb uh, not february what am i saying july and most when the other ones are are giving up so i hope that helps yeah thank you mm -hmm. glenn i got one more question glenn my property has uh three or four camellia trees or bushes, I guess they would yeah, be. Are they considered yeah. trees? <laughs> yeah, um, are, those, are those good pollinator sources? And when do those bloom? I think, I, if I remember correctly, it's very early. Yeah, uh, most camellias are not good bee plants. Okay. But there are some that bloom uh, in in December, and they and I have seen bees on them. But I think that's more of a function of well, there's just not much else blooming at that uh, point. So. You know they'll take anything that they can get but it's an it's a wonderful plant to, to bloom at that time I, to, uh, truth be told i'm not a big fan of camellias because they uh they're a little common too and you know i don't think that they uh, attract really any uh pollinators and their blooms don't last very long but when when they're out in bloom they sure look great yeah it's a very short bloom for sure yeah but you know keep an eye on it but and I think once again that they're at that point, even if they if there is anything for the any insects, there are a lot better choices yeah. available for the bees. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, on to Brian. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. Okay. Um, now we're going to get a presentation about Nosema from Brian Fackler. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about Brian. He had 45 and a half years as an electrical engineer in the Pacific Northwest and the Middle East. He's a hobby beekeeper with hives in Lincoln City, and he's a member of PUB, the Central Coast Beekeepers, Oregon State Beekeepers, Washington State Beekeepers. He's an active Cornell Master Beekeeper, currently mentoring two apprentices. If you have uh, questions for Brian during his presentation, please post those in the live chat. Okay, Brian, you're up. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you could hold your questions till the end and put or put them in the chat and we'll answer them at that time. Uh, we'll start out with a few little assumptions. Say that uh, you notice some spotting on the front of your hive and you've decided I might have dysentery and think, well, I need to take some action. And if you started looking at bee, catalog, uh, bee catalogs, uh, you might look at Dedant and uh, they would tell you Fumadellin B is the only known registered treatment. No residue in the honey is directed, cost effective, reduces expensive colonies. And it's more and leads to more productive colonies. You'd think this is probably a good idea. 
if you went to Man Lake, you'd have, you'd have a full page ad with 45% with fumadelin beet resulted in, uh, if you fed in the spring, you'd have 45% higher yields. If you treated in the fall, you'd have increased survival rating. Not, necess not necessarily wrong, but not necessarily telling you everything. If you went to better B, it was a little bit forth more forthcoming. So hopefully in this presentation, it'll be, you'll lead to a little bit no more knowledgeable beekeeper and, uh, and you can make some wise decision as a beekeeper. So let's start out. So the agenda we're gonna cover today, what is Nozema? We're gonna talk about the life cycle of Nozema. We're gonna talk about prevention and management. We're gonna talk about symptoms of colony infection. We're gonna describe the difference between Nozema apis and Nozema serenae. We're gonna talk about infected queens, drones, and workers. We're gonna talk about Nozema and pesticides. We're gonna talk about fumagellin and fumagellin B. We're gonna talk about natural products. We're gonna talk about where to send samples and you can diagnose the disease yourself. So Nozema zeme, Nozema affects older adult bees. It's a fungal gut parasite that uses the energy from the bee. Nozemosis is one of the most serious and widespread of all bee diseases. It's present in 50% of all colonies, probably including yours, the spores we're talking about. It's caused by environment remental environmentally resistant fungal spores and spread by bees. Nozema apis and Zerina and Nozema serenae are both single cell microsporidin fungus. This, this disease has been around for a long, long time. It was first described as Nozema apis in 1909 by Enoch Zander. In 1919, G.F. White described how it was spread by bees. Nozema serenae became was present in Asia in 1996. In 2020, they found out that the 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 disease was was misclassified, and it's actually not Nozema, but we're going to use that, and almost everyone is as the common terminology. But in the future, you might be hear, hearing about ver Veramofa. Okay. Honey G's ingest spores and contaminated food and fecal matter. In the host, the bee's midgut, in the bees, in the host bee's midgut, the spores grow as multiply in what is called the vegetative stage. To 30 to 50 million spores in a short time frame, six to 10 days. The spores are excreted in feces and the cycle is re repeated. Bees spread this by ingesting fecal matter, feeding each other, which is also called, and transferring food, water, nectar, tree resin, and trophallophysis in nest grooming cleaning cells, drone sperm to the injected into the queen, and foraging in flowers. Well, we're gonna talk about prevention and management. You can replace frames or remove the comb from plastic frames. We can reduce the exposure to pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides. You can keep colonies healthy and strong. You can use a good hive location with drainage. Sun exposure, especially in the winter. Low hive moisture and ventilation. You can build up weak hives with syrup, pollen, and frames of brood with nurse bees. 
You can replace queens mated by drones that are genetic, genetically diverse, especially replace older queens. Caution is swapping frames among hives and combining hives, especially if you suspect nosema. Prevent robbing. That's a kind of a... And no, use known local sources for bees. As in Canada, the, they import bees from New Zealand and they found that they have a very low resistance to nosema on the imported bees. If infected, here's some techniques that are possible. You can freeze hive woodenware frames and comb for up to four days. You can fumigate with this acetic acid. You can expose to heat. 120 degrees for 24 hours or 140 degrees for 15 minutes, and you expose to gamma rays. Um, hive bodies, bottom boards and inner covers or any other wooden parts of the hive can be fumigated with various chemicals, but none of these are very practical for the hobby beekeeper. Or they can be scorched with a blowtorch after scraping the interior of the hives, disinfecting with heat, the susceptibility of Nosema serrati spores to freezing may help explain why it appears there's, there's more of a problem in warm areas of the, of the, especially not the Northwest. Okay. So some of the symptoms of a holiday infection are reduced honey production, a dwindling population, Queen supersedure, winter colony loss, often present in weak colonies in the spring, they're slow to produce honey and brood. It takes microscopic examination or molecular analysis is needed to diagnose this disease. The primary location is vendrigilectus, or the midgut, which is often found swollen and whitish in appearance. Symptoms are often confused with other conditions and effects that affect adult honeybees. You might notice fecal matter on the comb or the hive entrance, and you have a reduced lifespan of 20 to 50 percent. One of the Confusing issues is dysentery is, is often result from, from fermented honey, dark honey with high ash content, unripened honey or syrup with high moisture content, or, con or, con or when confined to the hive for long periods. You should avoid leaving uncapped honey or sugar in the hive over winter during confinement. Nozema apis. You might notice in this condition, you have bees with crawling behavior, swollen abdomens, inhibits di digestion, dysentery has been recently disputed. So that's not necessarily a given anymore. The one thing to know about this is this disease affects 1% or less of all infections in the United States. So this is not a common is not the common form of nosema that you would see. You'd have excessive winter excrement or spotting on the exterior. Fumagillin or fumagillin B can be effective in treating this. It's, it's often related to a hive uh, winter, winter high spore count. Less than 100 spores can cause the infection and it's associated with long winters and limited flight opportunities. Nozema serene produces more spores in the bee's gut. It affects nearly 100% of all infections. It can also infect bumblebees. It's associated with no spotting on the hive. Fumagillin may make this condition much worse. Spore counts can increase in decrease in warmer weather associated with warmer climates and the honeybee immune system is reduced and unresistant to viral and other infections. 
Recently in Africa, a new form of Nozema, Nozema pneumanis has been found, and they virtually know nothing about it at this time. So now we're going to talk about what happens to, well, first of all, we're going to talk about what happens to worker adult bees when they're infected. They consume more food, they have reduced fat bodies, smaller hypo pharyngeal glands affecting brood food. They produce less royal jelly. They forage earlier in life and less efficient, and they die nine days sooner than non-infected bees. Infected queens have a shorter lifespan and often quit laying eggs and die within a few weeks. Drones infected lose sp sperm viability faster than normal, have a shorter lifespan, and, and transmit the infection more easily and those to other than workers, and they're often referred to as the super spreaders. And Nozema, the stress factors and interact stress factor interaction studies are only beginning to understand the interactions between Nozema and pesticides. Exposure to some neonectoids, insecticides, increases the susceptibility to Nozema infection with an increased death rate to the exposed bees, indicating that two stress factors interact synergistically to make the condition much worse than just on their own. Bees from brood comb with, residu with residual pesticides are more likely to develop Nozema serrani infections as adults. Thus, the environment in which bees develop is a factor in infection susceptibility. Eumagillin, is it effective? Is it safe for bees and humans? This is an interesting topic. Eumagillin is an antibiotic derived from a fungus originally to control Nozema apis in the 1950s. This inhibits an enzyme in the Nozema apis parasite met ap 2 and not the spores. Highs with Nozema apis when treated in the fall significantly increase survival in the spring. For Nozema serrani, which is the common form in almost all infections, studies find that spore production is 100% higher after 20 days of treatment, indicating an increase in the infection. The use of fumagillin targets the M. Uh, Fumagillin is toxic to humans and, and residue present in the honey can pose a risk to human health, including cramping, diarrhea, and, late, and weight loss. This product was taken off the market and unavailable for several years, and it came back as Fumagillin B. And this contains a, a component called known as DHC, which has been added, and this is shown to, to have potential chromosome damage capability, and it's unknown how long it stays in the honey. Uh, fumagillin cannot be applied while honey supers are present. There is no maximum residue limit for fumagillin in honey. When present, it usually just degrades within a few weeks. In the fall, when applied, this is mixed with Heavy syrup fed to the bees in the spring the, in, in normal syrup, or if, if the bees don't take it, it can be sprayed directly on the bees in syrup form. Natural products, do they work? Well, maybe. Whoops, excuse me. No zimit. Let's see, hang on just a minute. Is made from an oak bark extract. Common uses in Europe. No scientific evidence. Not registered in the USA as a treatment, and beekeepers are are permitted to use it. Hive Alive is made from seaweed extract, thyme oil, oil, and lemongrass oil, and is fed to colonies mixed with sugar syrup. 
One study found efficiency against no Nozema serrani with colonies fed in the in autumn syrup in winter candy board, reducing spores by as much as 50%. This is not, a red, is not registered in the USA and beekeepers are permitted to use it. Honeybee Health Healthy is a feeding supplement added to sugar syrup comprised of lemongrass, spearmint, and essential oils, and it is designed to improve overall colony health. One negative thing about this, this can cause robbing during no, low nectar times or dearth, especially in the fall. Where to send samples for analysis? Uh, you can send samples from Oregon State University. They've got a procedure where you send 300 bees from brood frame. They should be collected live, but then frozen to kill them. Seal, send in a sealed plastic container or Ziploc bag. They don't need to be sent with dries and there's no charge. Washington State University, you can also send bee samples and they would like those in a plastic bag with residual alcohol on it. And you can also send samples to the USA, USDA Research Lab in Maryland. They want you to send at least 100 bees if possible, collect the bees that are dying or have died recently. Bees should be placed in a should be placed and in and soaked with 70% ethyl, methyl, or isopropyl alcohol as soon as possible after collection, placed in a leak-proof container. The U.S. Postal Service, UPS, and FedEx do not accept shipments containing alcohol, so just prior to shipping, pour off as much alcohol as you can, just leaving the bees slightly moist with alcohol. You can diagnose the disease yourself. And I know that Mandy has a compound microscope. You need a compound microscope with 400 times magnification. You collect 50 adult bees from the entire colony and euthanize. Place in the abdomens, at, separate the abdomens with small scissors. Place in a small plastic bag and crush. Add 50 milliliters of water, that's one milliliter per bee abdomen. Use an eyedropper to pick up the solution and you place this on a special slide, hemocyclometer, and place the side in the microscope and pound, count the scores in the grids. Uh, there's a mathematical formula you use to calculate the number of spores. Uh, and from this formula, you can find the level of infection and and there's formulas on what to do it's not a complicated process but you've got to have them stuff to do it and uh, probably something most hobby beakers would not do themselves he paid points to take home nozema is a serious and widespread disease your bees have a 50 percent chance of being infected your beekeeping practices are your best defense. Most commercial products are not effective. OSU is your best option for analysis. And these are my references. I use the uh, Hive and the Honeybee, the 2015 version, Honeybee Biology, the third edition by Dewey Karen. Honeybee Disease and Pest, uh, it's a Canadian apricultural production that's really a great little publication. What do you know and everything you've ever wanted to know about honeybees and, and the world they live in by Clarence Carlson. Wealth of information in that book. I referred to the Cornell University Master Beekeeping Program on Nozema. The Eastern Apicultural Society written exams in 2017 and 18 for the Master Beekeeping Certificates. I looked at the Honeybee Infection 
in honeybees with by Penn State and the diagnosis and treatment of bees by Ben Solomon and Rob Snyder. And I'm open for questions now. I do have one question in the chat. It's about describing what the symptom crawling behavior means. What was what was that again? In your symptoms list, it said crawling behavior and yeah, one if you, person. If you, notice, if you notice bees at the at the entrance or on the ground near the front of your hive that were crawling, that would be commonly referred to as a crawling behavior. Hmm. Um, Brian, what does the, uh, you said there was spotting, um, yeah, at the, uh, what does that look like? Well, uh, it could be, it could be brown or kind of an orangish color. Uh, you'd notice small dots on the, on, on the front of your hive. Uh, and usually it's quite a bit. You're going to notice some in the winter time, but, uh, if you notice a lot, it would be the, you know, the bee feces that's been deposited in a kind of a liquid form on the front of your hive. Okay. All right. Well, um, if we don't have any more questions, I guess we'll conclude for this evening. Brian, thank you so much. Oh, you're we welcome. It was really informative and um, a little bit depressing. <laughs> well, but, yeah. it shouldn't be depressing because this is a disease that that good beekeeping practices and and being diligent as a beekeeper is is really your best defense and and really an effective defense. So it's usually you will, I have not ever seen this. Uh, when we were on the bee pizzas task force looking at hive problems, I've never noticed it. And I don't I don't know anyone that's really been affected by it. Uh, I've thought I've had it in the past, but I I I realize I have never had it. And uh, I think if you're a diligent beekeeper and uh, inspecting your bees and trying to do the right thing, your your probability of having this is is uh, diminished quite a bit. Can I ask a clarifying question, uh, yes. Brian? Um, so you had a list there where you were talking about um, like heating up the wood frames and the wood boxes and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, is that all for like... Um, Killing the spores. So you would do that if you knew you had an infection. And Absolutely. If, if, you had a, if you had a confirmed diagnosis that you had it, uh, that's when you'd want to you'd want to uh, take those kinds of actions. So does that mean? I mean, obviously, if I'm heating up my frames and my boxes and stuff, I'm probably killing brood and all of that stuff. So. Would I am I assuming that the nosema has just killed off the colony and then I need to do these things or if you if you had a serious infection and and needed to sterilize your your wooden ware and your hive of all the spores so that you could restart, that would be when you'd be doing this. Mm, okay. So your your colony at that point is just a lost cause and, and yes, your colony is a lost cause and, and okay. you want to you want to salvage what you've got to start over. Okay, got it. Okay, can I? Excellent. I'm sorry. Can, yeah, um, I actually, I'm. A, I was new my first year, and I didn't think something was right with my bees because it seemed like they would come out of the hive. And I was trying to think of what time in the year it was. Maybe towards fall, they'd come out of the hive, and they just like didn't have the energy to get up off the ground. And I knew there was something wrong and I did send it to OSU and um, got a positive confirmation on it. But what they said basically was that I had a high or a moderate high amount of nosema, um, but they didn't seem all that excited by it. I thought, oh man, my hive is doomed. Um, I did treat with Fumagen or whatever that be. Yes. And um, it was successful um 
And after that, I have been using Pro Health, and it seemed to take care. I mean, keep it under control. I haven't had, and and I it didn't spread to the rest of my hives. So I tried to stay on top of it every time I'd feed to make sure I was feeding them Pro Health, and mm -hmm. um, haven't you know? I and there have they didn't have any of the crawling or anything like that. Uh, no. Uh, no diarrhea or anything like that since then either. And that was two years ago. Did they tell you if you had the Nozema serrati or Nozema apis or were they able to identify it or not? You know, I'm I'm trying to uh, remember. I don't know if they did identify. I'd have to go back and look. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I'm sorry. I can't remember which one. I, that was as soon as you started throwing those names out, I was trying to think which one it was and I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Well, if there's no more questions, um, I guess we'll adjourn this members meeting and we look forward to our next meeting in February. Can I pop in for a second real quick? Yeah. If, if there's no more questions for Brian, but if people have other questions about the club in general, I don't know if there's new people on here. Um, that have questions about the club or what's coming up for the year, feel free to throw those out at us too. Okay, quiet group tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Guess we don't have anything. Oh, it looks like there's one more question from okay. Martins. Okay. And he, he asks, is a certain strain more resistant? Well, I would say Nozema serrani because we have an effective treatment for Nozema apis. So if you have a confirmed form of Nozema apis, the fumagellin works quite well of knocking down the spores and Nozema serrani, there is not a chemical that you can use to do other than increase your, your hive strength. Uh, you know, the action you would take would be, first of all, uh, requeening as soon as possible. And maybe if you had infected frames, Removing those from the hive uh, that you were suspecting and maybe even bringing in a frame, a brood frame from another hive with some nurse bees and try to get the, the hive strength built up. But other than that, you don't really have a real avenue. Or there's no real chemicals that are effective. So I would say Nozema serrani is, is uh, if you've got a serious infection with that one, that's going to be a hard, hard hive to survive. You're probably going to lose the hive. And that's not the case with Nozema apis. You can uh, probably survive with uh, fumagillin. Did that answer your question? Oh, yeah, specifically, yeah, he wants to know if there's strain a strain of bees. That's what I meant, not strain of nosema, nosema. Strain of bees like carniolans or um, Caucasians or Italians, any oh, particular. No, I, I, I don't know anything. I don't know that any. I know the bees from New Zealand are, in general, more susceptible to having it, but I have not read anything where. Italians or Russians or Cornelians are more susceptible. I haven't heard. Okay, thank you. What Appreciate I've heard it. is it's more of a, a climate area. The warmer climates, your your uh, susceptibility is increased greatly. Yeah, I asked the question at a commercial beekeepers conference here in Idaho yeah. if they were treating for it. And uh, the presenter asked for a show of hands. Nobody was treating for it. Yeah. So. Uh, it didn't seem, it seemed like the problem was not enough of a problem. I think that's what you indicated. It's uh, 
not all that prevalent. Yeah, I think okay. a good beekeeping practices are your best defense, and uh, I'm sure yeah. most commercial beekeepers are on top of that. Yeah, definitely. It's their livelihood. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, great. Well, everybody, thank you so much. And we'll see you again in February. Remember, any questions or any uh, suggested topics, please reach out to the board and we'll uh, try to get to it. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.